Uh, Mr. Ravi Chandra and uh, Bangalore Inter International Center, thanks so much for having me today. Um, uh, these are some preliminary thoughts I have. This is really the first time I've given this talk about a public library of India. I, I'm trying to write a book about the subject, and so this is kind of my first stab at, at telling you what I think. Um, so it's, it's preliminary. Um, I may have some of the things wrong here. What I'm going to do is give you a little bit about my background, where I'm coming from, um, tell you what brought me to India, why I spend every other month here. I, I spent, I think, five months in India last year. It was six or seven trips here. Um, and then I'll explain some of the things that we are doing that are preliminary steps that may lead to a public library of India. Um, I'll talk about our program called the Servants of Knowledge, uh, which is a bunch of volunteers, uh, some of our big data work that we're doing um, up at JNU and IIT Delhi, and then kind of step up a level and try to give you the vision for what a public library of India might be. Um, but first, I want to tell you a little bit of a story. Um, you know about the internet, right? Billions of users all over the world. But there used to be two internets in the 1980s. Uh, there was one that we now know of that was done by a ragtag group called the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, not a formal association. It was just a bunch of us that got together three or four times a year. But there was a formal effort from the In International Standards Organization. It was called OSI, Open Systems Interconnection. These were two very different models for what an internet might look like. Um, so our model was based on a dumb network. We didn't like the telephone company. We based it on the end-to-end -end principle in which anybody could build a web server, although we didn't have web servers in the early days. But OSI was based on the smart network, intelligent services in which the telephone company would provide all these things for you. And, and an example of those services are what you now know of as texting, SMS, smart messaging service. And I don't know if you remember, but when SMS first came out, it cost money. It cost 20 cents a text to do it. And that was their model, they would charge you for everything. And our model was that the network was stupid, and all the smarts were on the end, and it was up to you to invent new protocols and to do new things on the net. We had another big difference, which was our model was based on open standards. All the IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force standards, are available. There's no patent encumbrances. Um, the code based on the internet was there. We, we didn't take out patents on our stuff, although like when I invented internet radio, I don't consider it an invention, it was more of a hack, but I, I did what is now known as, as podcasting. And a few years later, somebody went out and got a patent on podcasting. Now that's been since beaten back because obviously there was prior art. But our model was that you didn't take out patents, that it was an open network, and that would lead to true innovation. And what we learned is that there's always somebody smarter than you out there on the net. And when the internet first started, uh, Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn came up with something called TCP IP. You may have heard of that acronym. TCP is a transmission control protocol. It's, so IP says you take a packet and you send it out to the net, and it may or may not get there. It's a best effort datagram service. TCP says, I'm going to send you a bunch of packets and I'm going to number them, one, two, three, four, five, six. And they may show up on the other end out of order. And what TCP does is puts them back in order. And so your program, your web server, now sees all the data that was sent in the proper order. Well, when TCP first happened, um, it didn't work when they first came up with the protocols, because what would happen is you would send a packet out and then another packet and then another packet, and the other side wouldn't get one because your network was congested. And so the other side would say, I didn't get packet number three. Now, the network was congested, and so you'd say, I didn't get packet number three, and then a minute later you'd say, I didn't get packet number three, and the other side would send packet three, and it sent packet three. And so you had congestion, and it made congestion worse and worse and worse and worse, right? So you never got your data. And so the internet wasn't working. And there was some guy at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory that looked at that and said, oh! And he came up with the 12-line patch. Did we lose audio here? We still going? He, he came up with a 12-line patch. 
that was called the back off algorithm. And what that said is when you don't get something, you say, I didn't get packet number three, and then you wait a minute. And then if it still hasn't showed up, instead of immediately saying, I didn't get packet number three, now you wait two minutes, and then you wait four minutes, and then you wait eight minutes. And that way, if there's congestion, you let the congestion go away. Now, th that's a somewhat technical explanation, but my point is some guy we didn't know came up with that solution, and that's why our current internet works so well, is because it was, in fact, based on open standards, and again, somebody's always smarter than you out there, and they came up with better solutions. So my work was as a techie. In the 1980s, I, I wrote a half dozen books on network protocols. Um, I wrote a book on relational database systems. I advised the Federal Reserve Board and other organizations on how networks worked. And I, I started to realize by about 1989 that the internet was going to be it, right? That this whole thing that we were doing in the Internet Engineering Task Force might actually grow to be billions of nodes. And in the mid-80s, when you said, oh, there'll be billions of computers online, that was hubris, right? It was like, oh, yeah, billions of computers didn't even exist. And the idea that, that you might actually have TCP IP in your cell phone was considered a real dream. But it happened. And by about 1993, I, I thought to myself, you know, one could actually do audio on this thing. And so I started Internet Talk Radio and podcasting, and we did live streaming. Uh, when Bill Clinton took office, uh, the White House folks couldn't get their routers through Secret Service because they had to go down to the Pentagon and be approved. But Bill Clinton really wanted to do White House demo. My radio studio was in the National Press Building, just two blocks from the White House. And so I got a call from the White House saying, hey, can you see the lawn from where you are? And I said, well, I can't see it from my office, but do you want me to go to the roof? And so I went to the roof, and we ended up running an infrared link down to the White House lawn, and I was able to put the White House online for the first time. Clinton came out, he gave his demo, proved that he was internet savvy. It took them several years before they were actually able to get the internet working properly inside the White House. Uh, but you could do stuff like that in the early days of the net, and it was a lot of fun. Um, I made my radio station a nonprofit organization, and I did that on purpose. I did it because I admired C-SPAN and National Public Radio, but I also did it because I thought there were other things that needed to be done besides radio. And what I ended up doing is putting large government databases online. I put the U.S. Patent Database online, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and then I ended up shoving those databases back down the government's throat. I said, this is your job, not mine. And that's the kind of thing I ended up doing for the, the rest of my career. I've been doing that ever since. Um, what I ended up doing in, in 2007 was starting this new nonprofit called Public Resource. And our goal was to put the law online. So I put the entire U.S. Court of Appeals opinions up on the Internet. Uh, we put a whole bunch of district court opinions. But there was one kind of law, and I'm getting to what brought me to India here, that was not available any place in the world, and that was building codes and electrical codes and fire codes. These are technical specifications, but they have the force of law. And in our modern world, they are some of the most important laws. Most people don't worry about sedition or income tax fraud or laws of that sort, but everybody cares about proper exits out of your school in case of fire or out of the nursing homes or in your home or is your electricity safe? Will it cause a fire? And all of these technical standards that have the force of law all over the world are sold for high amounts. So in the U.S., they're created by nonprofit organizations, uh, such as the National Fire Protection Association, with the purpose of becoming law. So they make the National Electrical Code, which is the law in all 50 states. It's the law at the federal level. But despite that, the California Building Code cost $1,000 to purchase. So I bought a copy, I scanned it, I put it online, and it was based on a Fifth Circuit opinion that says, hey, once it's a law, in the United States the law has no copyright, it belongs to the people. And so I put it online and nothing happened. I was kind of a little worried, and so I bought all the building and electrical and plumbing and elevator safety codes for the country and I put them online and then I started doing the federal government, occupational safety standards, uh, safety of standards for firefighter protective equipment, uh, safety of pesticides, safety of hazardous material transportation, and we got sued by six of these nonprofit organizations and that litigation is ongoing. 
Um, we are in the, uh, we went to the Court of Appeals. We had a minor win. We went back to the district court. We're in discovery. It's been going on for years. All my lawyers work pro bono, and that means they work for free. And I'm very lucky because our legal bill, I ask for an invoice every year, our legal bill in 2015 would have been $2.8 million because litigation is so expensive in the United States. So I was in the White House one day talking to my friend Anish Chopra, who is chief technology officer of the United States. And he said, so what are you up to, Carl? And I explained what I was doing with the codes. And he kind of laughed. And I said, well, you know, I'm thinking of doing India. He goes, well, you need to go see my friend Sam Petroda, who at the time was a member of the Manmohan Singh cabinet. And I went to see him, and I brought copies of Indian standards. And I've had this conversation since then with many others. And he's like, well, why do these cost money? So in India, they're not done by an NGO. They're done by the Bureau of Indian Standards, which is a governmental body. There's about 19,000 Indian standards. Uh, the building code is 14,000 rupees. It is the law in India. Um, there are many, many other standards that are, are really compelling, everything from toy safety to the safety of uh, code of practice for entry of sewage workers when they're cleaning out sewers. And as you know, many people go in there and they die. Uh, but these standards say every person entering a sewage system should know the following things. So these are not just standards for manufacturers. These are standards meant to ensure the safety of workers. And these are things that they should know. And so I talked to Sam about it, and, and I said, well, you know, I'm thinking of putting these online. And, he goes, and you know, they're copyright, and they cost money. And the, the policy of the Bureau of Indian Standards is even if you have a copy, you can't copy it for other people. In fact, there's a guy that's being sued for having put one of the concrete safety standards in his concrete safety standards engineering textbook that's being taught at all the IIT campuses. And he was sued by the Bureau for doing that. And I told Sam I was thinking of putting these online. He said, well, go for it. This will be good. <laughs> I was like, well, you know, the Bureau's going to be very annoyed. He goes, I don't care. Uh, well, I figured a member of the cabinet says it's OK. I just went ahead and did it. And I put all 19,000 standards on the internet. They're wildly popular with engineering students. We've taken 700 of them, and we retyped them. Right, so they're, they're in HTML, they work on your cell phone. We redrew the diagram so you can cut and paste them and put them into your Word document. Uh, we redid the formulas in what's called math ML, math markup language, and that means that if you're blind, you can hear the formulas, right? You can hear, you can have the standards spoken to you. We made them appreciably better, and after about a year of having these online, I got my renewal notice for my $5,000 a year subscription service from the Bureau. And I did what you need to do if you're doing this kind of civil resistance, which is I sent them a letter saying, yeah, I'd love to renew. By the way, all your standards are online. Isn't this great? Would you like the HTML for the ones we've already converted? And uh, needless to say, they lost it. We got a very nasty letter back. Um, I petitioned the government. We put together a very fancy petition with affidavits from, you know, professors of water engineering and from students in India. We had examples of how we made them better, you know, show and tell. We had a list of every standard required by state legislatures and, and by the parliament. We had a list of all the standards that are used in regulations. And the ministry turned us down. And so we've instituted a public interest litigation with the Honorable High Court of Delhi. Um, I have two co-petitioners. One is Sushant Sinha, who does Indian Kanoon, which is the service that makes all the Indian court opinions available. Just a beautiful, beautiful service, totally free. Um, and Srinivas Kodali, who you may know from his work in Adhar activism and, and looking for deletions of voters from the rolls. Um, so he's an activist. And we are in front of the Honorable High Court. Uh, we had a uh, hearing uh, in May this month, and we're back in front of the court July 29th. And so we are hopeful they will see our position. Uh, what we are arguing is that these are rules and regulations, and under the RTI Act, all rules and regulations need to be available. All standards are clearly rules. And so I don't want to prejudge this. It's obviously up to a judge to decide whether we're right or not. But in doing this, in putting the standards online, I decided I needed to make a deep dive into Indian law and Indian history, because what I am doing both in the US and in Europe and in India is civil resistance. I, I am telling government what they are doing is wrong, and I'm trying to get them to change it. And I learned an awful lot about how you do this kind of thing by reading Martin Luther King, but especially by reading Gandhi.
because he obviously, there is a discipline to Satyagraha, right? You don't just, if you're the only one throwing stones at the window, you're doing it wrong. You need to educate yourself and your peers. You need to petition your rulers. Before Gandhiji went to make salt, they sat in the ashram and they educated each other. And then he wrote a letter to the viceroy, dear friend, I'm going to make salt. You can stop this by simply making the salt available to the people. And so there is a discipline in how you do this. And what I do is obviously nowhere, anywhere close to what the liberation of India was or what Martin Luther King did or what Nelson Mandela did. But there are many lessons to learn from them. And so I began reading very deeply into Indian history, Indian law, civil resistance. And I started putting um, books online because every time I came to India, I, I would go to like the publications division bookstore and buy 100 books. Um, and we have a number of collections that are online on a place called the Internet Archive. So that's at archive.org. It's a nonprofit organization. They have over 5 million books online. It is by far the largest library on the Internet. Um, it is a good system for a variety of reasons. One is it's non-commercial, but it's a loading dock. It's a place that once I've uploaded something on the Internet Archive, you can download all those things, right, with a single one-line command. So it provides bulk access to the resources, and it's got very sophisticated uh, command line interface so that as a technical programmer, I can very quickly change things like the creator or the title or the language tags. And so it's a, it's a place to put data and make it available for people to read as individuals, but it's also available for other people to download. And like I said, there's always somebody smarter than you on the internet. So other people can take these materials and work with them. Now, we've got a number of collections up on the Internet Archive already. And one of the things I've been doing is harvesting everything I can find on the net related to India that's already online. And so your government, for example, had something called the Digital Library of India. They had scanned about 500,000 books. They did a pretty bad job scanning, right? Uh, pages are missing, titles are wrong, but 500,000 books, including like 40,000 in Sanskrit. And I made a copy of that. I got about 450,000 of them, and then the government took their own server down, um, and it's been down ever since. And so ironically enough, I have the only copy now of the Digital Library of India. Um, and we have books in 50 languages. We have 40,000 in Sanskrit, 20,000 in Telugu, we have books in Gujarati, we have books in Bangla, and even though the scans are bad, it's the only version of many of these, these very valuable books. We've had over five crore views on this collection just in the last year, year and a half. In addition to that initial digital library of India, which by the way had copyright problems, they were very sloppy on copyright. So the first thing I did after I put it online is I brought everything up in, in spreadsheets. And you know they had books from Oxford University Press from 1990, and you can't do that. Um, and so I went through and I knocked about 50,000 of the books out and took them offline. Um, we still get occasional takedowns, but like I said, I've had five core views on this. I get maybe once a month, someone will write in and say, oh my God, you got my book online. And with a large digital library, that happens. And we answer immediately and we say, oh, so sorry, we've removed it. And so we really haven't had any copyright problems. Um, that's a lesson I'll return to, that you know, copyright is not this binary thing. So in addition to those books we initially got from the Digital Library of India, I was able to make a copy of 23,000 books from the West Bengal Public Library. Uh, those got added to the collection. I went to Tamil Virtual Academy. They had 8,000 books in Tamil. So we're up to about 4.4 lakh books in that born digital collection. We've had volunteers going through. So for Telugu, for example, um, the government had transcribed all the titles into Roman script. And there's actually a standard for how you go from Telugu to Roman script, but they didn't do that. They just typed them in. And so we had a volunteer here in Bangalore go through all 20,000 books and retype the title and creator in Telugu script. So now you can search for the book and actually find it. And so we have people making those collections better. Uh, but the collection that I'm most proud of is the Hind Swaraj collection. Um, we put a uh, full version of the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi online, all 100 volumes. Uh, I got that from the Sabarmati Ashram. They gave it to us. Uh, I found 129 audio files from All India Radio of Gandhiji speaking at um, prayer meetings in the last year of his life. 
And so for each of those, you have the audio file, and I was able to pull uh, the translation of those speeches out of the collected works and set them in HTML. So you can hear the speech, you can read it, and these speeches have footnotes. You can click into the footnotes or you can click into the collected works so you can see what letters he wrote that day and what letters he wrote the next day and then you can see the next speech and you can every few days he would give a speech on All India Radio in the last year of his life. You can actually walk through the last year of his life. Uh, we found the selected works of Nehru online, but they were missing 10 volumes, and so I bought those volumes and added those. We have all the works of Ambedkar. I've been going to used bookstores and online. We have a very uh, good collection of, of the books of Radhakrishnan. We have the letters of Motilal Nehru. We have the Mahav Desai diaries. Uh, there's about 500 books by or about Gandhi in that collection, uh, but we've expanded it. Uh, we have a collection of Indian history books from the Asian Educational Services. They did all these beautiful reprints of, of books by, by, you know, the British Raj, but also by, by people in India or Jesuit priests who came here and learned Tamil and translated key works. Uh, they went out of business. And so I've been systematically buying as many of those as I can find and scanning them. We have over 500 of those books online, and my goal is to rescue that entire collection and make it available. I've uh, got about a thousand um, books on Indian science, botanical survey of India. There's books from the archaeological survey. There's movies from the Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts, from Sangeet Academy. There's a whole bunch of audio. Um, and all this stuff is available up on the Internet Archive. So now getting to the Public Library of India. So that was fun. Um, when I was giving a speech here, um, I was asked to give a speech at the Indian Academy of Sciences. And they fetched me from my hotel early, and I, I found myself in the president's office for like 25 minutes, and nobody was around. And finally, the executive secretary and the editor of publications came rushing in, said, oh, I'm so sorry we didn't expect you so early. We're having a meeting with a vendor. We're thinking of digitizing all our books. And I just looked at him, I said, well, you know, I'll do that for you for free, but go do your meeting. So they did the meeting with the vendor, and they came back, and I said, look, just give me the books, I'll scan them, and I'll put them online. And I did. It was about 59 books. It's a complete works of C.V. Raman, for example. Fascinating stuff. And as part of that, I was able to go to my friend Brewster Kale, who runs the Internet Archive, and I got him to donate a scanner. Now, the, the Internet Archive tabletop scanners, these are $15,000 devices, right? They have two very fancy cameras. They're pedal operated. So what you do is you put the book in a cradle. You hit the pedal, and the book goes up to the glass. It takes a picture, takes a picture, and you let it down. You flip the page. You hit the pedal again. So it's kind of like a spinning wheel when you think about it, right? Up and down, up and down. And when you get good with these things, you can do 800 pages an hour. Um, and it's very high quality scans, and it's not just scans, because they're taking a picture of the page, and then you push it into the Internet Archive, and it crops the page, and it de-skews it, it straightens it out, it de-warps it, right, if there, if there was a curve in the page, because it's nice and thick, if it's in English or a Western language, it runs it through optical character recognition, um, it puts it online, it's got facilities for metadata, so it's this whole workflow that pushes all this stuff into the Internet Archive. So I got this scanner shipped to India, and we got it through customs, that was not easy, um, and it went to the, uh, to the Indian Academy of Sciences. Now, my theory was that their IT manager would learn how to operate the scanner, and they would hire someone to actually like do the scanning, and they'd supply the books. And um, when I talked to Bruce DeKale at the Internet Archive, and he was kind enough to donate this scanner, he said, you know, Carl, whenever we give a scanner to somebody, they're all excited, and they don't use it. It just sits there. And that's going to happen to you. Um, and I said, well, trust me, I'm going to make this work. But he was right. It just sat there because, you know, the IT manager has to support all the people and their computers. And, um, and these are somewhat difficult. You have to calibrate the, ca you know, the cameras and you have to learn how the Internet Archive works. It's, it's a whole thing. Um, and, and so I thought the key was that we didn't have enough scanners. And I went back to Brewster Kale and I said, I want more. And he goes, oh, come on, you know, you're, you're just not going to use these things. And so we cut a deal. I've, I've worked with this guy for many, many years. I, I gave him the first hardware that led to the Wayback Machine, which archives, uh, archives the web. And I said, look, what if I make scanner number one actually work? 
can I have some more? And so we cut a deal. If I could get scanner one going 25,000 pages a week for two weeks, he'd give me two more. If all three scanners would do 25,000 pages a week for two weeks, I would get three more. So that's six scanners. And so I thought to myself, how do you do this properly? Um, and I had been in talks with people like Mohandas Pai, and when I went to see him, and I, I boasted, I said, you know, I bought 100 kilos of books and I'm shipping them back to the US. And he's like, why the hell are you shipping these back to the US? Why aren't you scanning them here? I said, well, we're just unable to do the, the level of quality that I need, the full workflow. And so based on my conversations with Rooster Kale and with Mohandas Pai, I kind of rethought our model. And I came up with what is now called the Servants of Knowledge. It's a hat tip to Gokhale and his Servants of India. It's a tribute to public workers. Um, I have been giving speeches all over India, in many cases to techie audiences. If I'm in Bangalore, the Google folks will invite me to come out and give a tech talk. And when I'm in Chennai, the Linux users group invites me. And I had been in Mangalore, and I know a guy that runs a tech company with 60 engineers. Um, and so it's an easy invite, and I, I like talking to my own people. Uh, we can talk at a technical level. And so I thought I know all these people all over India. And so the model for this servants of knowledge is you have a place, like the Indian Academy of Sciences. You have a supply of books, right? And the, the idea is that the Indian Academy would find us all these science books to scan. You have tech volunteers that learn how to operate the scanners and learn how the internet archive works and then maybe we hire people that actually operate them but the people that own the scanner it's it's my scanner right it's not the indian academies and the volunteers don't work for the indian academy they work for us right it's just like the internet engineering task force um, and so we've got this up and running in Bangalore. We've now scanned one lock pages. Uh, we have Shiju Alex, who is very good technically, and he is passionate about Malay Alam literature. Um, for the last year and a half, he's been scanning books. Um, and in the last two months, he's been able to scan more books than he did in the entire previous year. We have um, Om Shiva Prakash, who is passionate about Kannada books. And he's been going to publishers and asking them for rights saying, look, you know, you have these books that are out of print. Can I have permission, please, to scan these and put them online? Uh, we have Arjuna Rachavala, who's the guy that did all the Telugu you know, titles and stuff. And so I have three very good technical volunteers that have learned how to operate this. We have hired an operator now who's there every day. But every weekend and every evening, people like Shiju come in and they do their scanning on stuff. And so this place is for scanning science books, but they allow us to scan other things. They don't particularly care. Um, and the Indian Academy has been very generous about that. So we have a supply of books that we've been getting. Shiju goes and, and gets loans from people, from people's personal collections. Um, Om Shiva gets permission from publishers. Every time I'm in town, I go to Blossoms and I read them for as many old books as I can find. I was customer of the year last year at Blossoms. I, I went in and I, I spent one lock in one day there once. Um, I came out with six really heavy boxes full of these Asian educational services. Manager came running out and said, can I get a selfie with you, please? Um, <laughs> Uh, but we're also getting a supply of other books coming in. So we just cut a deal with the J.C. Bose Museum in Calcutta in which we're going to scan J.C. Bose's personal library, all the books that he owned. Uh, we now have an agreement, we, we think, with the National Center for Biological Sciences uh, here in Bangalore uh, to assist them on doing their archives. Uh, we're also getting some born digital stuff. We have lawyers that have been doing um, uh, RTI requests and getting old government commission reports, and they've been feeding them to us. And so the Bangalore chapter of Servants of Knowledge is up and running. I mean, we're, we're, we're really going at this point. And we met our milestone. We met our milestone of 25,000 pages a week for two weeks. And so I have two more scanners on the loading dock in the United States, and I'm going to ship them in June. We're going to put one in Mangalore at the Konkani Cultural and Language Center, uh, which is a beautiful, beautiful building. They have a hostel, and they bring in kids for a summer camp. They do skills education. They have a large library. They already had a scanner, and like you know, many of these scanners, it really wasn't getting used very effectively. And so we have really good volunteers in Mangalore, and they've gone in, and they, they've been working with the existing scanner, and they're going to learn how to use the new one. And again, we got a supply of books. We got a place. 
And um, I gave a speech there just, just a week ago to a whole bunch of librarians from the, the area, from Goa, from Mangalore, from Kerala, and they're all excited, and so I think we're going to have a supply of books. Um, our third scanner is going to go in Chennai, where we have amazingly good technical volunteers. And, you know, the Tamil people are passionate about their language. Uh, and the, the guy who is our, our lead volunteer there already has a free Tamil ebook site online with 800 books. He goes to authors and say, may I have permission to, you know, put your book online and, and gets permission. But there's the Roja Mathai Library there. Uh, we are hoping to work with the Tamil Virtual Academy. We don't have an agreement in place, but we've had several meetings with them. And so that's the initial three um, scanners. Uh, we are looking at putting one in Kerala, maybe one in Ahmedabad. I'm going to go up and talk to the Sabarmati Ashram. Uh, the Punjab, there's some very excited people there that are very good technically. They're already digitizing. Uh, Hyderabad, there's an amazing technical audience there. Um, and so this decentralized model is something that I think can grow. Because when you go to some place, I've been to many libraries, and, and many of them are like, well, give us a million dollars, we'll buy a bunch of scanners, we'll hire a company, you know, we'll do this all ourselves. And what we have here is a different model in which someone, let's say Sabarmati Ashram, wants to begin scanning. We say, look, the model is let's go find those technical volunteers, go find someone that can buy you the two scanners, and we might start making them in India instead of just shipping them in from the U.S. Uh, the frames are, you know, just metal. Uh, there's no reason we can't manufacture those here. And it's a model, it's a bottom-up model. Um, now, the Internet Archive has a bit of that, but they also have a factory in the Philippines. They have 100 scanners in one place. And they send in shipping containers full of books from America to the Philippines, and they scan them. They're doing about one to two million books a year. Um, so it's possible that in addition to this bottom-up model, maybe we're going to need a factory someplace in India. Uh, but I think the mo bottom-up model will demonstrate, first of all, the standards of quality. It'll demonstrate the open access principle and why that makes sense. You know, many libraries will digitize books, but they don't put them online because they want to hire a bunch of staff and build their own web servers, and so they wait. And they don't do anything with the work they've done. So we're scanning books, we're harvesting stuff digitally, and we're pushing it to the Internet Archive. That is a loading dock. I mean, it's got a user interface. You can use it today. We've got a lot of people using it. But I think it's important that it not be the only place these books are. So we have an agreement in place now with JNU and with IIT Delhi. At JNU, we're spinning over 550 terabytes of disk installed in their computer room. At IIT Delhi, we have 250 terabytes. This is, this, this is big iron. This is a lot of data. And our, our vision is that these become the data depots, that we take the data from the Internet Archive and we push it back into India, and we put it on the National Knowledge Network, where any university or research lab can download it. And they can use it to build a web service. So we're not right now concentrating on building a user interface. Right now we're just trying to peel as much of that data from the Internet Archive off um, and bring it back to India. I have these suitcases that will hold, you know, 16, 10 terabyte disk drives. Um, and while I'm in India, I have my servers downloading data onto these disk drives, and the hope is to systematically bring them back. And so that service is just up and running. Uh, the service is doing one other thing, um, which is actually kind of interesting. Uh, we are, so some of the data that we have on these servers is in copyright, uh, particularly scientific journal articles. And we can't make those available to everybody, but we are making them available to researchers to do text and data mining on a collection of 73 million journal articles. And so scientists from government research labs are using this facility, so they're not, it's called non-consumptive use. Right, Your computer is reading the journal articles, but you are not giving the journal articles to other people. You're using them to do things like search for keywords right, or to analyze language patterns, to do big data, artificial intelligence, text and data mining. That is the forefront of computer science research. So you might use this database to do better uh, natural language processing right? if you're a computer scientist. And so we now have that facility available, and we actually have researchers, like I said, from JNU and IIT Delhi and from government research labs that are doing some potentially very important research 
on the, in these databases. So that's what we are doing. So let me back up a level. Um, so I believe in India, there are just vast treasures that are buried in the libraries and government laboratories, just vast treasures. And many of those treasures are being destroyed, as we saw from the, the floods in Kerala. Um, there's places where termites are eating up the libraries. I think it is vastly important that much of that information be digitized. And so my goal is can we scale our model up, right, with a few servants of knowledge in, in three different cities, can we scale it up to where we're doing three million books a year for a decade and scan 30 million books? Because I believe that is the number of books that need to be scanned in India. Our Library of Congress in the United States is in the 20, 25 million books range, almost all in English, a few other languages. Uh, but I think if you look around India, and you look at Gujarat Vijapith, for example, with all its books in Gujarati, and you look down in Kerala with the books in Malayalam, and you go to Kolkata and the books in Bangla, I, I believe that's just a vast treasure trove that d definitely needs to be scanned. Um, it needs to be a combination of this decentralized model and potentially a factory, but I think it, it can't be a big top-down government thing. Right? I don't think you can have a ministry say, we are doing the Library of India, we will own it, because that's what always happens, is, is these groups begin doing digitizing, and then they restrict access because they think that's important. And one of the excuses that's often given is copyright. I think it's more than copyright. I think it's more a control issue. But copyright is the issue, and so I want to talk about that just a little bit. Um, now, I want to remind you that I made a living writing books for a decade, so I'm a big fan of copyright. But copyright is not a binary thing. It's a limited series of rights for a limited period of time. And I have absolutely no problem with Ram Guha selling his book. I bought three copies of your latest Gandhi book, uh, one of which I tore apart to like scan the footnotes. Um, but you know, there's things like fair use. Um, there's a bundle of rights. Um, and so I think we need to start with the old stuff, but I think we need to scan everything. And if nothing else, to scan it for archival purposes and big data research, because I think that's very important. But let me remind you that, that copyright has an exception on a global basis for the blind. You can make any book available to people that are blind, even if it's in copyright, and that's an international treaty. Um, digital lending, one of the things that the Internet Archive does is they'll buy 10 copies of a book, and they'll scan it, and they'll put the book in a warehouse, and then they'll lend the books out. With digital rights management, you know, you can't print the thing, you, you can't, you know, take it and, and give it to other people, but you can check the book out and read it, and then check it back in. And so they're doing digital lending. Um, in India, any book, no matter what it is, can be available, made available by a teacher to a student in the course of instruction. That is one of the exceptions to copyright in India. It's called the teaching exception, and the Delhi University case was very clear that that was allowed. Um, and then finally, there's, there's questions of orphan works. So in the United States, um, anything before 1924 is out of copyright. Books from 1924 to about 1950, if they are not available on the market today, if they are not in commerce, a library may scan them and make them available. And the Internet Archive does that. Um, so there are orphan works. There's a lot of books that are technically in copyright, but the publisher's out of business. The author doesn't care. It's an obscure monograph. And so when I see a book from 1930, that has to do with the liberation of India, for example, you know, it might be in copyright technically, I scan it. And if we get a takedown notice, obviously we remove it. But we get very few takedown notices on these obscure books from the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. And so you need to be careful about copyright. There's one more thing, which is works of government. So in India, the government can have a copyright on books, and they do. They assert copyright. If you go to the publications division and you buy the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi, there's a copyright notice at the beginning of each page. Um, if you buy the Builders of Modern India, which is 60 volumes of biographies that the government commissioned that are available very, very cheap, uh, you know, it's 50 rupees a book. 
that are not, uh, many of them are not in print anymore. They're certainly not online, but there is a copyright assertion. Archaeological Survey of India has a copyright assertion. I believe works of government should not have copyright on them. I believe those should be available, particularly for a non-commercial use such as mine. I have been systematically putting many of those books online, and I may have to bear the consequences of that. Uh, my hope is that nobody in government will find that bad. And more importantly, I am more than happy to hand them back a disk drive of their books and say, you should put them up on your server. So we've got several hundred books from the publications division, and they've only got a few e-books online. I would love nothing more than for them to take our scans and make them available on the government servers. So why is this important? Now, you may think to yourself that, you know, universal access to human knowledge is kind of a highfalutin goal, and there's real problems in our world, right? There's climate change and governments that aren't doing anything about pollution and climate change. There's poverty and disease. Um, there are, there's a food surplus in India and there's 200 million people that are not getting enough to eat. There is rampant disease and there's thousand dollar pills that could cure those diseases that are simply not available. Um, I will put it to you that a democracy is based on an informed citizenry. Uh, John Adams put it very well in his dissertation on the canon and feudal law. He says that in order for government to work, the citizenry must be informed, that we must let every sluice of knowledge be set aflowing. And I'll put it to you that if your government is not taking care of climate change and pollution, there's only one way to change that, and that is for us to educate ourselves. That access to knowledge, if you think economic inequality is a problem, providing young people with the means of education is absolutely crucial. Um, half of the population of India is 25 years or younger. Uh, there is growing economic inequality, and if we don't provide the means for people to educate themselves without having to be enrolled in an IIT campus or one of the fancy prep schools, we will never be able to solve these, these pressing societal issues. So access to knowledge is a necessary but not sufficient condition if we want to change how our society works. Now, you may ask, why India? Why am I not doing this in the U.S.? or in Europe? Well, there are many reasons. Uh, India has a long tradition of access to knowledge, particularly if you go back to the libraries of Taxila and Nalanda, um, and particularly during the Gupta era and the Chola Empire. Now, there was a period after that in which knowledge was heavily restricted, right, in which the Vedas could only be available to certain people. But there's also the long tradition of access to knowledge. India played a key role. You know, it's funny, in the United States, we think of numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 as being Arabic numbers. Well, as you know, they are not Arabic numbers. They are Hindu numbers. Um, and if you look at the early history of the, uh, the, the Greeks and the Romans and the Persians and the Arabs in India, it was a vast melting pot of knowledge. And in fact, after the libraries of Nalanda and Tuck Sila were destroyed, much of that knowledge was preserved in Persia and in the Arab countries. And many people that were scholars went to those places to learn Sanskrit. And much of that information then went back. And so I think that long tradition of access to knowledge is key. I think the fact that the population of India is young uh, is very important. But I think most importantly is the fact that knowledge has been colonized. It has increasingly become the corporate property. And that's particularly true with scientific knowledge. Uh, scientific knowledge is increasingly behind paywalls, is not available to students. Um, many universities cannot afford the subscriptions. Even Harvard University has had to cut back their journal subscriptions. Knowledge has been colonized. Now, what Gandhi did was more than simply liberating India. What he did was showed the way for decolonizing the world. And that makes me think of India as a place that perhaps might set an example for decolonizing knowledge. India has a long history of dealing with difficult issues. Look at the Buddhist councils which Ashoka was one of the patrons of, that, that looked at issues of how do different religions perhaps work together. Um, India has been a place that has 
been willing to claim knowledge from the bottom up. Look at the Bengali Renaissance. Look at the work of Aruna Roy um, and MKSS, which started in a little village in Rajasthan and grew to be a national movement with the RTI Act being the gold standard for uh, access to information. Now, maybe not in its actual implementation today, but the RTI Act is in fact the strongest in the world when it comes to freedom of information. But most importantly, I think there is a tradition of public work in India. And I think what's inspirational there is when you look at the fathers of modern India, many of them were fancy lawyers that, that gave up their practice to become public workers. And I'm talking about Nehru and Sardar Patel and Rajaji, Gandhi, a long tradition of people saying, I need to spend part of my time doing bread labor Right, and I think scanning is the new spinning. I, I think people should be scanning on a daily basis. I think people doing open source software are doing bread labor. You remember when Gandhi first started doing bread labor, it was not spinning. It was the, the, the printing presses at the Phoenix Ashram, and everybody had to do typesetting every day. And Gandhiji was very bad at typesetting, but he did it every day, and everybody had to do that kind of manual labor. So printing and the dissemination of knowledge was, in fact, the original bread labor and the original public work. So those are my, my preliminary thoughts uh, about a public library of India. Some of them are perhaps half formed, but I thought I, I would tell you what I've been thinking and I'm, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions or hear other points of view. So thank you very much. Yeah. And we have an audience mic, so please use it. I'm sorry, I will not be able to get out. But I'm really impressed that you are doing what you are doing at this stage. I would like to share, this is not a question, but some of my experiences. I'm one of the perhaps oldest librarian and with a huge experience. And I was one of the people who brought in medlar systems into the country and is the CD-ROM technology into the country. At that time, we thought that we have got a huge knowledge of today when you said about Sanskrit. I got people from Kashmir to Kerala to have a meeting. How we can digitize, put it on the computer, and uh, or maybe cut CD-ROMs and uh, preserve this knowledge. Lot of it was in palm leaves and uh, manuscripts and so, so on and so forth. We had an excellent person from Lister Hill who came to advise us. But unfortunately, when I was hearing you, the scanner that we got, it was not able to take the script from the pal palm leaves, read that into the system. We had a lot of errors. So there is nobody who could sit with us and correct those errors. So maybe my vision about 35 years ago was a little too early. I'm very happy today you are doing that. Well, thank you. So optical character recognition is, is in fact one of the biggest challenges. Uh, the early scanners, I, I went through the same process you did with the CD-ROMs and the early scanners. Um, it was very hard to do. One of the things that I'm doing with Sushant Sinha this year, the guy who does Indian Canoon, is we're beginning to pull books out of the Internet Archive, bounce them off Google Vision, which does a pretty good job on OCR, and then shove them back into the Internet Archive. And we're finding that if you have those very high quality scans, you can do that. Now the palm leaves are incredibly difficult um, and they're very fragile um, and that's something that really needs to be preserved before they disintegrate. Um, that, that is absolutely crucial that we do more See, with those. That is one of the things we had a difficulty. We got all that. For instance, the Sanskrit Academy in Melkote, the priests there with their uh, uh, Panchakancham and all that. They were all trained by us to key in the Sanskrit things into the computer because we were not able to scan them. 
then we got the lister hill person to come and do it but it was still at that time perhaps it was too early for us to have done the thing it was 26 years ago so one of the things we're trying to do is we know that there's a whole bunch of things that need to be done in the future we're trying to do very high quality scans of as much as possible so even if we can't read the sanskrit today we think the computers are going to be smarter in a few years and there's going to be other things we can do when i talked to brewster kale at the internet archive he has a vision and the vision is when you're reading a book and there's a footnote you have to be able to click on that footnote and if he's got the book you not only go to that book but you go to the page in that book that's been cited and he wants to do that automatically on all 5 million books that he's got now we can't do that today but if you've got the high quality scans we've laid the groundwork so that in the future we're able to do that so that that's one reason i focus on this mass digitization many people try to do one set of books really really well right like type them in perfectly and you know have all the databases and things but that's not where i am in the food chain where i am is getting the bulk data available so that other people can build on top of that yeah so i you know unlike the lady here who's actually done stuff i am one of those useless academics who always has a lot of questions but don't really work in the domains that i have questions about so you you talked about the fact that yes your work in the food chain is about bulk digitization whereas you are leaving things like user interfaces for others to you know build on so i i sort of would like to hear your views on whether the two needs to be parallel processes otherwise do we do we lose the value of this digitization and i'll just quickly clarify what i mean by that so for example even though we create all this knowledge online 95% of the people are going to get this knowledge through say wikipedia but it's the wikipedia editors who are going to probably utilize these resources and make sure that wikipedia articles reference these things Yeah, I, I would them, disagree so. with that characterization. So I, I would say that yes, many people go to the Wikipedia and, and digest the summaries, uh, but the number of people on the Internet Archive is very substantial. So yes, we have to do this in parallel. And one reason I use the Internet Archive is because there is a user interface. One of the things you can do that's incredibly cool on the Internet Archive you can't do in many other places. And I've done this many times. When Ram Guha, who has who has just left, but um, when when he will put a quote. online like from neru what i can do is take that quote and i can shove it into my hinswa raj collection i say search inside the book and it'll come back and it'll say volume 32 of the selected works of neru and you click on that and you open it up to the page where that quote is So it's a pretty good user interface when you think about it. Um and that's one reason I use that as my initial loading dock. Huge number of users on the internet archive and I think if we begin pushing this stuff back into India, uh when I come to India I bring a little uh, 2 terabyte disk drive with a Gandhi label on it. I call them Gandhi drives. And I typically bring 7 or 8 or 9 of these things with me and whenever I give a talk at like Mayo College for example, I give one. to the headmaster and say give it to your computer people and put it on your local network um and so you need to do both uh but but the important thing is i understand where i am in the food chain and i do the best i can as far as a user interface it's what i do with government data um like my standards my indian standards are far better than anything the government offers but it's still not nearly where it could be right i i could make them way better uh i do as much as i can uh just to get them up and running and make them usable and then i i leave the full bells and whistles to the next generation to do uh but i do try to make them usable to end users cuz one of the things if you're going to government and say you're doing it wrong you know you can go to them and say you're doing it wrong hi i work in a think tank i wrote a paper much more effective is you're doing it wrong and by the way i have 5 million users that are using my version of it and they really like it you should be doing this that has much more impact with the government minister because they they know what eyeballs mean right these politicians they they know what votes mean um and when you say every iit student is using you know these standards and they go okay that's a lot of people so thank you <laughs> thank you. 
Thank you for that absolutely mind-boggling presentation. And by the way, that's one of the best images I've seen in a long time. Your. Um, <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> whoever it was, congratulations. Um, I, I'm sorry to sound pessimistic or like devil's advocate, but you have been making the case for, if I can synopsize it, for universal or almost universal access to information. But we seem to be living in a world that is increasingly trying to restrict that. I mean, when the President of the United States will not give information to Congress, let alone the citizen, when RTI is being dismantled in this country, where are we? Well, we are in a position where we need to, as, as uh, Justice Ranade said, uh, we need to educate ourselves and warn our rulers. We, we need to say this is not good. I mean, it's like global warming and pollution. We could simply say that's just the way it is, or we can say this is an absolute tragedy and we need to do something about it. I, I am an optimist, I will grant you that, but I, I think every generation has a promise. And, you know, in a previous generation, it was inventing computers or aviation or roads or modern medicine. And I think our great promise, now that we've built this internet, this universal means of, of, of communication, um, we have two challenges. One is to move that means of communication out to everybody, right? So that access to communications is in fact a human right. But then I think access to knowledge is the great promise of this net. I think the internet can be more than than TikTok and WhatsApp fake news. And, and I, I think it has great potential to change the world. And I think we have to at least attempt to do that. Maybe we won't. Um, and if you want to be pessimistic about something, um, think about the people that said the Raj needs to go away and India needs self-rule. Boy, that seemed like a long shot in those days, didn't it? And they managed to make it happen. I, I think you have to embrace a goal and at least try to do it. And maybe you fail, but at least you've tried. Question down here. Uh, this is, is you know, wonderful to hear you. Mine is not so much a question as uh, uh, sort of seeking your advice, if you like. Some of us are concerned about the fact that you know, even a city like Bangalore really doesn't have a light. <laughs> and in fact, nobody seems to worry about it. Even the public library system that we have is really, you know, uh, in, in shambles. So some of us are really thinking that whether we can sort of launch a campaign of some kind and conceptualize a certain kind of light. It doesn't have to be a research library. But, you know, something, you know, it may not be like New York Public Library, but at least in function, something like that, it allows the end of minds in Bangalore to go to a place and access the things that you are going to make, you know, uh, uh, available to them. Like, there isn't a place. Uh, so, I wanted to know, you know, since you have worked in India, you work, you know the problem. I, uh, I was actually, Dr. Ramani was actually giving me your <laughs> old articles <laughs> on, on, on India. So, I was actually, you know, looking at it and seeing that how you have actually made progress in it in achieving the Sura standards or whatever. Uh, what would you say? Would it be possible? Do you think it, it has any chance of... Uh, yeah. So let me let me address that, but let me first acknowledge that Professor Romani is here. I wrote about him in 1992 in a book called Exploring the Internet. He's one of the real pioneers of the internet here in India. Uh, he was one of the first people that helped create ERNet. Um, and I'm just so glad that you're here today. Um, so libraries are no longer warehouses for books. Um, they are places where you learn how to learn, where you learn how to access information. I spent an awful lot of time with librarians in the United States. Many of them have been very strong supporters of my legal efforts to make information available. They've, they file court briefs in our support. And the libraries I admire the most are the ones where, where the librarians teach senior citizens how to use their cell phone and find information on Wikipedia and where the kids can come when they have no other place to go and they can learn
learn how to read books and to teach themselves. And, you know, maybe it's a physical book. Maybe it's an e-book. Many of our libraries are starting to lend e-books, even ones in copyright out. And I think there's a vital role for these kinds of safe public spaces. Uh, many of our libraries in the U.S. are where the homeless go um, in order to get out of the cold, to learn. Many of these folks are quite smart and, you know, they're, they're down on their luck, but they want to come in and read a book or read a newspaper. Um, and I think there's a, a real need for these kinds of public spaces. And I think the library is that kind of a public space. And, you know, India has a long tradition of public libraries. Uh, movement started, um, you know, in, in Madras and Chennai, uh, but spread throughout the country. Um, I've got a book called The Hindu on Libraries, which is all the articles that they've written about libraries since like 1920. And it's just fascinating to see that. And I, I think there's a huge need for that. Um, I know in the case of the Bangalore public libraries, that's a huge problem. They, they don't have money. Uh, they don't pay their people very well. They've had huge union problems. Um, and, you know, that's clearly a, a pressing priority. Now, I know there's other priorities in, in our governments and in our society, but I, I think this is one of the key ones. Uh, education can't be more than, uh, it's got to be more than just rote, you know, learning in a school for a certain period of time and you're done. Um, it, it's got to be a continual lifelong process. Um, and so I, I believe that, you know, my efforts on a public library of India that goes online uh, must be coupled with efforts to move the internet out into the villages so that people like Bunker Roy at Barefoot College have access to information that when he sends people out into villages to, to work on solar power, that they're able to access the information they need to maintain those solar power things, that a kid that works in the fields all day because their father needs them there can come home at night and, and teach themselves. And I think in the cities, we have to have those public spaces. Um, so you got to do it. Um, and again, it's it's got to be a mass movement. It can't just be a, a top-down government thing. So yeah. yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Rangashri Kishore. I'm the Dean of uh, Libraries in Kriya University, which is a very new university coming up, similar to Ashoka University in Haryana, where I was working there. Uh, one of the things that I, I, in my experience as a university librarian, I felt that uh, a lot of, uh, though the professors are from Harvard, Stanford, they, they insisted on physical books. Though we wanted to promote digitize, digital open uh, access uh, digitally, but they were more interested in procuring more and more books, physical books. So uh, how do you see the challenge of well, you know, those professors will get old and they're going to be replaced <laughs> by younger ones. But also, I mean, I, I know libraries just don't have room for all the physical books. And that's one of the huge issues in the yeah. U.S. is deaccessioning the books. So I, I, I do physical books. When I, when I travel, I have 10 hardcover books with me. Um, that's my problem in my suitcase is, is you know, I have a, a few clothes um, and a lot of books. Um, and so I'm a big fan. A lot of the books that I want are just simply not available online, or at least they're not available online until after I've bought them and scanned them. Um, and so physical books have their place. I think it's important that a major research library have a reasonable collection, but I think it's also very important that the, the professors learn to work with the information that is not available there and you can't have every book in one library no. uh even harvard even the library of congress doesn't have everything uh the books that i get about you know old indian history many of them i have to go find on the used market they're just simply not there i'll look in WorldCat. No libraries will have them, or one library will have it. And, uh, you know, you can use interlibrary loan, but you just have to train your professors to learn that if they're going to do significant research, they can't simply depend on the books that you have in your library because their research is going to be missing a lot of important stuff. And so if they're serious about their career, they're going to have to learn to adapt. I think it's nice if you come to our university. Yes, <laughs> no, I'd love to. Talk. I'd love yeah. to. 
and the other question is uh, uh, do you have this uh, z39.50 server where we can import the metadata or something? Uh, so the internet archive supports z3950 that is a metadata uh, standard uh, in fact Brewster Kale uh, invented ways which uh, used z3950 in the early days and he had a huge influence on the Library of Congress uh, that said uh, they are metadata agnostic and so there are many different ways of doing things and their core Core metadata is just simple, you know, um, um, uh, um, field and value. So title, creator, publisher, and as a collection maintainer, I can invent anything I want, right? They don't enforce those standards. Now that said, if I see a METS file or a MARC file, those are two metadata standards, I will upload those along with the information that I harvest from the net so that it becomes available. But no, we have not done the full fledged. Now that's the advantage of getting the real libraries involved. One of the things the Internet Archive does though is when I, I scan a book, if there's an ISBN number in it, uh, they will go in and they will find the metadata from WorldCat or one of the servers and they will use that to populate their metadata fields. And so it's, it's sort of in the middle. It's not as rigorous as, as you would like in a real library. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, again, our goal is to get this stuff online um, and make it better as we go yeah. along. Quickly, uh, one more thing is that uh, our university is coming up. It's a very new university. We still haven't started our undergraduate courses this year. We would like to, in our new upcoming library, we can help you scan books. That would so be can wonderful. Can we get a scanner? Uh, well, maybe. <laughs> They're expensive. I, I think our model is that let's find somebody in your area who's got a lot of money to buy you the scanners. That, that's. Uh, by the way, if you do need to reach me, I am easy to find online. I'm Carl, C-A-R-L, at media.org, M-E-D-I-A dot O-R-G. Uh, media.org, I ran the first radio station, so it was easy to, in those days, you could just ask for domain names. You didn't have to register them. So um, so feel free to send me email. I'm more than happy to, to um, respond. Any more questions? Uh, we have one right here. Uh, thanks, Carl. Uh, my name is Pradeep. I am part of the library team. I'm librarian at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements and uh, upcoming institution uh, at Sadashiv Nagar. So, just want to I just have uh, want to share uh, about the uh, library model that we work. So, uh, we started in 2009, and uh, the library has been operational at the Sadashiv Nagar uh, since 2012, and. Uh, We've been very clear uh, the library has to be made public, and we are an institutional uh, library, but uh, the management and the institution took efforts to make it open to public, and we have been open to public since 2014, and uh, very recently we crossed 50 members. We allow anyone to come to library. We have people from neighborhood who come and use the library, and uh, yeah, so we allow anyone to view the electronic journals and databases that we have within the premises. And we have membership plans mainly for borrowing. But otherwise, it's an open reference library. And uh, if you know anyone, uh, you know, uh, our IHS mission is mainly on urbanization, but we, we cut across different disciplines. And we have currently a fellowship program. We have a master's program upcoming. So just want to let the audience know. OK, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Any more questions? OK. One more. Thanks, Carl. Um, you started your talk by talking about the two internets. And I just wanted to sort of pose that maybe this, uh, as, a, as a final. Uh, is, is there a possibility where, I mean, the standards that you're talking about, let's say in a TIFF or a PDF or the internet as we know of it today, is something that morphs into something going forward? You know, we, we already have spaces like Facebook, which are relatively closed you know, within this larger thing that we call the internet. So I'm curious to know, I mean, as you're thinking of this sort of broader digital library, um, what if this space is not the space uh, for the dissemination of knowledge going forward, say 20 years, 30 years from today, the formats that we discussed? So how do we think of the interoperability of the spaces that we're building so that this can then be pushed on to something We that's have relevant. a huge challenge ahead of us, which is it is very easy to go from the end-to-end -end principle to the closed cloud. 
right, in which your space is owned by Facebook, Inc., and you saw what they wanted to do with free internet and internet.org here in India, right? Um, it was going to be half-assed access for free, but you needed to upgrade if you wanted the real internet. And we have to fight that. Um, and the way you fight that is by using services like Wikipedia that are open and the Internet Archive. And I'm a big fan of some of these cloud providers. I, I know the folks at Google very well. Um, Eric Schmidt used to be on my board of directors. Vince Cerf used to be on my board of directors. Uh, I admire their stuff. Um, I put many of my videos on YouTube. My, my channel there has had over 80 million views. It's a huge success. But I also make sure to put the stuff where it's available in bulk for anybody to download it. And I think that's one of our challenges. I have seen a lot of government servers that take the data and they lock it up in a screen reader and they make it hard to download. Uh, one of the things I will often do, the way I got the original works of Nehru, was I went to a server that only had them in a screen reader, and I grabbed every one of those JPEG files and reconstructed a PDF. It wasn't high res, but it was better than nothing. Um, and one of the things I've been systematically trying to do is take this data that's already online but not accessible in the right format and making it available in a way that's much more accessible. And I think we have to fight this tendency to say, well, gee, Facebook's going to solve this problem for us. Um, we need. I don't use Facebook anymore. I'm sorry. I, I just don't believe in that model in which they own me. Um, I don't like their user interface for one. I think it's ugly, but I just don't like the business model. And I do not like what they've done to our election elections in the United States. I think that was absolutely horrendous. Um, so I, I think we need to fight that, and that's the only answer. And if we don't fight it, we are going to be dependent on three or four large companies that own your online presence. The internet doesn't have to be that way. Um, and that particularly if you're in a university or in a research lab, you have a responsibility to make your data available to everybody else and to make it available in an open format using standards that are accessible. And it's very tempting to say, well, gee, I'll just give it to Google. Google Culture Labs, which is fine. You can let them have your data, but then also have the data available for other people to use in other ways. And I think that's a responsibility we have, particularly in the public sector. If you're in government, I think that's an, a special responsibility. And I think many government folks have not realized that. And that's something. It's often very tempting to just hire some IT company and outsource the whole thing to them. And I think that's shirking their responsibility as a public body. Um, I think they need to make their information available so that everyone else can use it. It's a fight I'm having with the state of Georgia. They have put the official code of Georgia annotated online, um, but it is only available through LexisNexis, which has an exclusive right to sell it under whatever terms they determine are appropriate. And I got sued by the state for having violated those terms and putting the official law of Georgia online. Uh, we lost at the district court. The U.S. Court of Appeals came down heavily in our favor, saying the law belongs to the people. This was not a copyright violation. The state of Georgia has now appealed it to the United States Supreme Court, and they brought eight attorney generals in with them from other states. Uh, we, we responded and said, you're right, the Supreme Court needs to look at this. Um, it's an important issue. What are our rights to make the law available and inform our fellow citizens? Um, and so you got to fight for these things. Yes, uh, I okay, have a very, question. very quick comment more than a question. This is exciting, and I'm a huge fan of open source and uh, the Internet Archive. Um, my comment is, you know, this is very exciting for me because I've been looking for a space here in Bangalore to scan my great-grandfather's diary. I have a lot of family documents. Uh, he was converted, for good or for bad, by American missionaries. And I, as a brown lady, looking at all these, you know, these histories from the 1800s and the early 1900s, obviously I have a lot of reactions to them. And I was looking for a space to have a sociological uh, perspective on this. And I was, this is exciting to me what you're doing, the, the excellent work that you're doing, because I would like to invent commentary from all over the world on something that I think has had such a profound impact on society today. Mm -hmm. That's, that's basically it. Okay, so we're not yet a service bureau in which people can just drop stuff off and, and get it scanned, but send me email. Uh, is this in English or what language is it in? Mostly in English, a little bit of Tamil. 
Okay. But predominantly in English. Uh, send mail. Uh, like I said, we're not quite there yet. Right now it's three volunteers and one staffer. And, you know, we got this big backlog of science books and stuff like that in Bangalore. But the goal is to have places where you can begin scanning personal papers. And if you have old books that are out of copyright, you ought to be able to bring them in and get them scanned. Uh, and that's the hope is that we're able to move in, into that kind of a world soon. Um, so, and, and by the way, it's not hard to scan yourself. You know, you, you can get a, a, a scanner on Amazon for a, a pretty low amount of money. Anybody can get an Internet Archive account, right? You can, you can just register and you can upload a book. It, it's just that simple. Um, and many of these scanners let you scan a bunch of pages and turn it into a PDF. Uh, you get yourself an Internet Archive account and you upload it and there you go. You're ready to go. Um, okay, thank you very much, everybody.